Hello, and welcome to IO4's Asian Conference on Language Learning and Asian Conference on Technology in the Classroom 2016 in Kobe, Japan. Our theme this year is Convergence Divergence, and we're bringing together some wonderful speakers from around Japan, such as James York from Tokyo Denki University. Welcome, James. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to get a chance to talk with you again. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, hope you're having a good conference so far. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, the city's beautiful. The, uh, the the attendees are great. It's um, it's been really eye opening, and yeah, I'm having a, a great time. Thanks for having me come along. Good. I think one of the first things I learned about that you've been working on mm -hmm. was something called Kotaba Miners. Okay. And I know a bit about it, mm -hmm. but um, I could certainly stand to learn a lot more. Okay, uh, Kotaba Miners. So in case anyone doesn't know, the word Kotaba means word. So the idea is word mining. And the project started uh, initially from my interest in using games to learn languages. My own experience as a language learner started in about 2005 when I was playing massively multiplayer online video games just for fun and then I quit and my friend said would you like to play again with me and I was like I'll only do that if I can join a Japanese guild because I wanted to be in a, a, a Japanese environment right. so it was, a, it was an excuse right. to, to play the game again yeah it's a good way to justify spending exactly. a lot of time playing a exactly game. so yeah. my own language learning experience was by joining a, a target language speaking guild and playing the game together. So that was my, uh, it, you know, my interest started from there. And then I became a university teacher and I wanted to con continue my research in, well, actually I was looking for a research topic. I started university with, with a kind of vague idea of what I wanted to do. Mm. I thought about my own learning experiences and thought, right, games, I think they're useful. Okay. And so I started to look through all the different games that were out there and it was kind of hit and miss my preliminary experiments with, with various games weren't really going very well. So to cut a long story, a long story short, uh, I looked at massive, uh, massively multiplayer online games and actually rejected them mm. um, and looked at social. Why, why did you reject them? Because for the, the students that I were teaching, mm. that I was teaching, the uh, low level right. EFL students, the discourse within those games, it's, it's quite complex. You have the quest texts, which are extremely complex for a yeah. start. Then you have the social uh, con uh, interact interactions between other players. Mm. And it's native speakers that you're interacting yeah. with. And then you've got the GUI, which is also right. extremely complex. And so all these cognitive so, loads on the low-level learners right. is just too much. Yeah, it's hard enough to do that kind of social interaction in a context <laughs> that you're familiar yeah, yeah, with, yeah. let alone with all these other layers on top. So of yeah, the, the level of difficulty of the technology was actually a withholding factor. Yes. And then I looked at social worlds, which are basically uh, void of content. There's no production company behind it. There's, there's no content actually made, so right. people make their own content. And you'll find a lot of schools have foreign language mm. uh, areas in social worlds. But I, I rejected those as well. Um, as a teacher, the content creation was far too time consuming. Right. There's, I'll be talking about later, but there's, there's like wikis of how to create content. And that for, as an educator, that, that was a kind of barrier for me. I didn't want to go through all that, that effort just to make some activities for my students to yeah, use. If you're spending 20 hours planning for a one-hour lesson, um, you're not going to really be doing much yeah. educating. Yeah, so that was a kind of yeah. uh, the negative points for me about okay. social worlds. And social worlds, again, there's, there's quite an adult theme for, to them in, right. in Second Life. We won't touch on that. but So yeah, essentially, um, MMOs and then social worlds are the two predominant parts. Um, I rejected both. And at that time, the game Minecraft came out, which... Um, is a brilliant game. It has a s it has the game element. There's a, a survival mode, but there's a creative mode, which so it, it crosses both borders. It's not an MMO, but it's not a social world. It can kind of be both. It's very fluid in its in how it can be used. And okay, so the good points about yeah, Minecraft were the that sort of the the creative mode. Um, maybe for people who haven't actually seen the game, okay. they could Google it. Mm -hmm. But in my in my image, it kind of looks like a big world built out of Lego, Lego and yeah. stuff that you, you can build, yeah. but you can build things into it, mm -hmm. and and it becomes quite interactive with people. It's yeah. not just assembling mm -hmm. a kit. Right, exactly. It's a free, massive 3D world of Lego create, creation, essentially. And so for, as an educator, it was very easy to create 
activities and things mm. you know, very, very quickly. You could get prototypes or just activities made. And mm. for students, the, the GUI is very, very simple. The, the graphics are very simple. The, mm. there's, it's not an MMO, so you haven't got hundreds of native speakers to interact with. And so it was a very, very, very easy tool. So the Cotoba Miners project came out of all of that. That's the okay. history of it. And Cotoba Miners it was a project that I started to teach English to Japanese students mm -hmm. through a semester. And as part of that, I invited uh, native English speakers to come and help. Right. So uh, you know the, the website Reddit? It's, yes. a, it's a popular news website. I posted on there saying, I'm looking for native English speakers to come and interact with my Japanese learners. Mm -hmm. How about that? Okay. And so they came. And then in their millions <laughs> from Reddit, <laughs> no, <laughs> not millions, but there was no. a, there was a substantial population of English speakers that would come and help right. out because they were interested in learning sure. Japanese. Okay, and so the idea to interact with Japanese learners was was brilliant for them. Mm. So it was kind of give and take. Okay, so what happened is that the semester finished, and all my Japanese students just stopped using the tool, they mm. stopped using Minecraft, and I had this population of English speakers that wanted to learn Japanese. Okay, so Kotoba Miners actually is it's a Japanese course for non-Japanese speakers. It's for people that want to learn Japanese. Right. And it's an elementary course that I designed in the world Minecraft. And yeah, it was really successful. And there was classrooms and activities and it's very, very interactive. And it was really successful. I, I was yeah. happy with it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how uh, it, it relates to something we, we heard about in another presentation where uh, teachers were doing blogging with students and this idea that they're going to interact with mm -hmm. Each other and perhaps other people around the internet, and then the term comes to an end, <laughs> and they're gone. I mean, yeah. students are just so busy. So these other people mm. have far more motivation. So this brings me to like a, a, a pretty key point in well, at least my own thinking of how technology should be utilized. And for the Japanese students that were learning English, my my general English classes. I don't think that the, the virtual world was a useful tool. Mm. Obviously, they, they, they well, it, it's debatable, but still. Maybe we can say it had its uses. It had but its they uses, were but <laughs> the needs of the, um, the guys that wanted to learn Japanese, mm. it was much more, there was much more of a need for the virtual world. Why? Because I had people from Finland, Australia, uh, the US, the UK, all meeting in the virtual environment when they wouldn't have the opportunity to speak to people in Japanese in their right. own environment. And so there's a real need for it. Right. And, and I think that that's one of the things that uh, teachers that are interested in technology really need to consider. Um, mm. Is that tool the perfect tool for, your, for the job that you want to do? And in some cases, it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, that, uh, not to keep calling back to other things, but uh, something that Stephen Ryan was talking about this morning, about unpredictability. <laughs> we think we can predict what the needs yeah. are. but. Yeah, you could get surprised sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But on the back of the Cotoba Miners project, um, I'm doing a PhD, and so from this needs idea, mm. I started to think, well, if the the communicative, no, 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 not communicative. If the spoken performance between people online is better than offline, then I can mm. prove that there's a need for virtual worlds within low-level EFL classrooms. Okay. So my, my research right now is looking at the spoken performance of my Japanese students doing face-to-face -face tasks versus nice. online tasks okay. um, as a way to say, well, do we actually need this virtual world in a, a monolingual 30-plus student classroom okay. or not? And if, the, if the, the research shows that the online communication was um, more complex or accurate or fluent, then there's a a bit of weight to say, well, actually, virtual environments are pretty useful. And they have their benefits. They have their benefits over face-to-face -face communication. Okay. Not just that. I mean, mo motivational uh, characteristics of students as well. They might prefer to work in a virtual environment because kids are gamers nowadays, right? right? So, right. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Good. And, and this, this work that you're doing currently with Japanese EFL learners mm -hmm. uh, doing some tasks through yeah. an online environment, mm -hmm. Is that also Minecraft? Yes, it is. It, okay, the yeah. same environment. It's the, the same, same environment. environment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if I understand correctly, in Minecraft, you can create environments that are visual and three-dimensional to move around in, but also you can create logic or logical structures in here also. So is that part of what you were having your Japanese EFL learners do? <coughs> okay. Um, the 
logical part of it is called redstone. It's been used in um, different fields of education, for example, um, uh, maths and yes. science, yes. Um, it, because there are, like you said, lo you can make these very simple logic gates, and you can even model small computers in cool. if, if you go really yeah. deep with it. But I don't personally use that um, in my classes. It's fairly limited, okay. and there are just a massive amount of plugins that mm -hmm. you can use to achieve higher level logic and um, basically you can make mini games within okay. within Minecraft itself okay. via plugins. Okay. But yeah, uh, in other educational fields, it has been utilized a lot. Okay, yeah. but maybe that's coming back to one of the issues you found in the uh, MMORPGs mm. of you, if you start laying on, layering on too many layers of complexity, then you, you run into that problem. Absolutely, again. yeah, you keep it simple. Sounds good, sounds good. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, uh, yeah. And you're, do, you're giving your featured presentation later today. That's right. And you saw a couple of the presentations this morning and yep. some of the concurrent sessions. How's it been going for you so far? Yeah, the plenaries were, were really good. Um, very surprising um, that, uh, for example, uh, Miss Professor Ohashi this morning, she talked about the resistance uh, yes. that she's facing with technology implementation in Japanese universities. And it's, it's something that I've, maybe you've struggled with as well. Right. Um, so Certainly. To, have, <laughs> to have that um, as a presentation was, was fantastic. Um, it really, I think that the good thing about that was that it showed, uh, w well, what, what I noticed was that a lot of the people that are not from Japan were kind of shocked at that. And yeah. so that was a very, an important presentation to, to actually show other yeah. people that this is the context here. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the, pre the, the conference itself, it's been extremely professionally run. Um, there's been a lot of, for example, we had the sideshow, if you want to call it, the, right. the, the drummers, and we, we got to learn about the, the photography award. And yeah, it just, that, was, it, that was pretty stunning. Yeah, it's just, it's just such a far-reaching conference, and what would you call it? A, a team, it's, yeah. it's fantastic, yeah. Okay, great, thanks very much. Thank you everyone for watching, and thank you James York for joining us. If you would like to learn more about IO4 conferences, publications, and events, please visit io4.org. Thank you.